<clears throat> if you're worried about should you include any meat in your diet, how much meat should you include in your diet, uh, should you avoid meat at all costs, then this video is going to help you understand these questions from an ancestral perspective. We have lots of evidence of what human beings have eaten over the last 300 years and evidence of what our ancestors have eat, eaten for a million years. And so if you have a common sense bone in your body, you're going to realize that, gosh, if our ancestors have been doing something for millions of years, then it's probably okay, perhaps even healthy, perhaps even optimal to continue to eat the diet that our ancestors have eaten. I've got the great honor today of having Mickey Benduri here. He is an archaeologist, anthropologist, paleoanthropologist uh, who's been studying this topic for years, and he is going to give us insight into the literature, uh, not just nutrition and medical literature, but the anthropology, the paleoanthropology of this question, which the more I try to rediscover a proper human diet, I find that that question to be very, very important. So without further ado, welcome, doctor. It's such a pleasure, such an honor. Uh, same here, same pleasure, yeah. Uh, give us a, a quick uh, biographical on you, uh, your training, what you specialize in, et cetera. Okay, I started my training as a, an economist and uh, did also a business administration and worked for until I was about 52 uh, in a commercial setting. In the end, I was buying uh, companies, and for, for, unfortunately, not for myself. Right. But uh, and then at 52, I decided to retire and uh, went on to study archaeology and especially interested in uh, hunter gatherers uh, because this is, in, in, at least in Tel Aviv University, this is the place where we could, uh, I could learn more about hunter-gatherers as they serve as a model. Uh, recent hunter-gatherers serve as a model for archaeology, for many archaeologists. So they tend to study them quite uh, intensely. Yes. So that, and, uh, then, then, I, then I did a, a PhD in, in, uh, in archaeology, but in fact, it's a paleoanthropology in, in American. Yes. And what, uh, that's one of the things that I've been studying for the last few years is the diet of uh, existing hunter-gatherers. And also, I'm a great um, student of American history as well. And so uh, in my research and reading about Native Americans and their current plight, it occurred to me that you know all the the hunter gatherer societies that we still have in the United States the the the, the Comanche the Navajo the uh, Apache the Kickapoo none of these indigenous people are on the land that they would choose to be on if they hadn't been driven off their their land kind of their ancestral hunting ground and then when I, I started looking at other hunter gatherer uh, uh, of cultures in Africa and Australia, I found that they too have been pushed to what we would call marginal land, basically the land that nobody else wants, that is the most Absolutely. unproductive land possible. And so that made me question how much weight we can put on what the diet is of modern hunter-gatherer cultures. Could you go into that a little bit? Uh, what can we learn from modern hunter-gatherers? How much have they been touched by modern society and how much has their diet been changed by being pushed to basically worthless marginal land? There are two processes, one that you described, and the other one is that even if they had chosen the land or they had or could live in the chosen land, uh, it is not the same land that uh, existed over two and a half million years of their, of their evolution. So 
You're right, absolutely. The, the land is not the same land. Uh, for instance, uh, you're talking about uh, Americans, uh, and, and there it's very, very obvious. But uh, a lot of uh, archaeologists use the Hadza of Tanzania as a model. And this Hadza live, and I was there about two years ago, they live in uh, a bush which has a, doesn't, it's not a savanna, okay? Uh, if you go about two hours uh, north or so, you, you come across the Serengeti and you come across uh, Ngoro Ngoro, which is a uh, game reserves. And there you see what, what, uh, what kind of animals Savannah can carry and what is the re relation, uh, relative uh, biomass that Savannahs have or fauna compared to flora. And you see that uh, the, well, well, the Hadza lives today, uh, there is no savanna, there is no grass to speak of. So the animals that live there today are small and, and uh, few and far between. So the, the, it's not the same conditions. You know, already in the 60s, Archaeologists used a lot of uh, analogies with uh, with recent uh, cultures, and they came to the conclusion that in order to have an anal analogy, you have to have the environmental aspects and also the technological aspects, both of them identical or close to being identical, in order in order to do an analogy. That's not the case today at all. Not from the analog from the technological and not from the environmental. So, and I, I wrote a paper about it, and I what, I what I said is that there's only one context that you can actually use um, observations, uh, and some sort of analogy, and this is where you find the same thing in many environmental circumstances, in different environmental circumstances. So if you find the same thing in the North Pole, and in the equator, then you can say, okay, that makes sense, and it's very likely. And, and for instance, example, one of them is the fact that the uh, uh, hunter-gatherers share their uh, their uh, hunts, and this is true in the North Pole, and this is true in the in the equator. So you can assume that this sharing took place also during uh, our evolution. But definitely, the, especially the ratio of uh, quantitative uh, aspects, like the ratio of uh, plants to animal source food, there's no way you can learn anything from, from present hunter-gatherers. Uh, and the reason I ask that question is we, we see many influencers, some of them doctors, uh, either MDs or PhDs, kind of touting the modern hunter-gatherer diet as the diet that we should eat. And that's why I asked that question, because I believe that that sets up a false paradigm because these people, first of all, are not uh, on any hunting ground that they would choose if they had their choice. And then secondly, as you intimated, uh, there's been several extinction level events over the last few million years, but one that really affected the Homo sapiens sapien uh, culture was the, some people call it the Younger Dryas event about 12,700 years ago. We don't know if it was volcanoes or a huge asteroid or some combination, but there was a, a huge extinction event of the megafauna, which would be animals weighing over 100 pounds. And so prior to that event, all of our ancestors, that, that now I'm, let me just clarify, I am an armchair anthropologists, paleoanthropologists. I have no formal training whatsoever, but the way I read the literature before, let's just say 13,000 years ago for, for even numbers, there was a much larger selection of megafauna to be hunted on the savannas. And it seems that that's what our ancestors tended to focus on. Uh, but then after whatever that event was, 12,700 or so years ago, we had to focus more on smaller game. We had to focus more on 
uh, including more plants in our diets. Any any enlightenment you can give us on that that time period? Okay, but uh, I have to I have to be careful here as a, yes. as a, a presumably scientist. The, for comparison with the Paleolithic, what I said is is relevant. But for comparison and the question of whether it is healthy or not, then we have to be a little bit more careful because these hunter gatherers, and even if you go even further, uh, closer closer to us, if you take uh, you know Western Price uh, uh, societies, they were healthy. So it doesn't mean that we cannot draw some conclusions about health, uh, healthy foods from, from hunter-gatherers, recent hunter-gatherers. But uh, this goes to the crux of my, uh, I think my little angle as far as what paleo uh, is. And what paleo is, in my opinion, is a safety template. In other words, it's not that we are not, we cannot eat plants. People who ate plants, including hunter gatherers, including uh, more recent societies, they were, you know, most of them were quite healthy. <clears throat> we are in terrible shape, not because we eat plants, but because, in my opinion, because we eat the wrong plants, we don't prepare the plants, and and we don't have we don't know what is our uh, genetical makeup that is uh, uh, we are adjusted to it or adapted to eat uh, plants for my for instance in myself i have a very very strong uh, uh, gluten uh, sensitivity i don't have celiac but i have very strong gluten sensitivity but i didn't know that and I ate, I ate bread. And you say, okay, we eat bread. Bread today uh, is nothing compared to the bread that uh, traditional societies. You know, we have in uh, Israel, we have the uh, Jews from all over the place, all over the world. So we have from Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, they have a different, uh, uh, different, uh, Different form of the bed, uh, bread comes from teff, not from wheat. Right. Different form of cereal, I was going to say. And uh, they ferment the teff for two weeks before they consume it. And nobody delayed consumption of food for two weeks without reason. Excellent. So, so we call bread and we call bread what is now done in one hour what the french use when when the french do uh, their their bread they they ferment it for 12 hours etc uh, etc et when the indians eat the uh, chapati this is a low gluten uh, species okay of wheat so uh, the, the Japanese are adapted specifically to their diet. Every, every community that live for a long time with a certain diet, first of all, know very well how to prepare the diet, and secondly, are adapted genetically to the diet. So all these blue zones actually represent uh, societies or, or, that, or communities that lived for a long time in the same place, know how to prepare their food. I'm not speaking of another, other problems with the reporting on what they eat, because in right. Sardinia, for instance, the, the one that actually live longer life eat almost only uh, food from animal sources. Yep. But uh, and then they report that they eat, uh, the reporting, the, 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 the data is, uh, is uh, funny. But uh, you know, and this is the problem today. So hunter-gatherers can be a good model for healthy eating if we know everything. 
But since we don't, let's go back to our uh, evolutionary. That's my po my uh, point of view. Let's go back to the safety of our evolutionary uh, safest food, which is meat. Oh, I totally agree. Now, there are many people who would say, well, Dr. Barry, Dr. Bendor, how do you even know? How can you possibly know what a human being ate 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, a million years ago? That, that's, that has to be unknowable. So walk us through the, the technology and the research. So if you find a, a fossil of a, an ancient human who's 85,000 years old, how can you possibly determine if that person ate red meat, if how much meat they ate, how, how do you know if they ate C3 versus C4 grains? How, how can you tell how much meat they ate? Walk us through that, uh, keeping in mind that many of us are not paleoanthropologists. And, and, and so try to explain this in common sense terms. How do you even know that? You know, the funny thing is that the answer is not in archaeology. Uh, intuitively, people went to, came to archaeologists to ask what, people, what they ate. Uh, and unfortunately, there, apart from one, one uh, area, which I will talk about in a minute, uh, you cannot tell, you can tell one thing. We find bones. And we find uh, some less, of course, remains of plant food in archaeological sites going back two and a half million years ago. So we know what they ate. And what they ate is not a big problem. Uh, and there's no argument whatsoever among uh, archaeologists regarding what people ate. They ate whatever they, uh, they can put their hands on. And this is fish, but, uh, meat, uh, fruits, uh, tubers, uh, whatever, 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 whatever you can think of, they ate. The big question is how much of each, or, or at least in our terms, how much, how many, how much plants, and how much, how much uh, uh, meat and fat. And fat, by the way, also is important because of the problem that uh, or the, the image problem that fat has so the funniest thing is that the question of quantity as far as archaeology only one real uh, measure exists and this is the stable isotopes but this can, you can go back only about 50,000 years ago which is quite a lot but, uh, you know, evolution uh, took place, human evolution took place over two and a half million years. So 50,000 years ago, you can take collagen, uh, can extract some collagen from the bone, and you can still measure uh, stable isotopes. And depending on the amount of a certain isotope of uh, nitrogen, uh, isotope uh, 15, you can, you can uh, determine what was the relative uh, quantity of meat? By uh, you do it uh, by measuring uh, the same isotope in uh, carnivores of the same area uh, and herbivores, and you see that the humans were actually had the same level as carnivores. So and even much a little higher than carnivores, but for reasons that we know, but I don't want to go into now. In any case, as far as the isotope 15, the evidence is uh, so clear, you know, wherever, whenever you find, and you need to find the, not every humans that you can find that's 50 years old will have enough collagen to check, but the ones that you do, they all consume. Uh, they were carnivores. There's another way uh, you, you can know uh, what, what, whether it was fish or aquatic, uh, because aquatic uh, 
uh, organisms have higher uh, nitrogen 15. So if you see that it's way higher than carnivores, then you can uh, determine that they use fish. And you see, when you have a site, for instance, in Sicily, uh, where you have uh, humans that lived, let's say, 15,000 years ago, and then you have another group that lived 5,000 years ago, and another group that lived 3,000 years ago, you see that they used to consume uh, terrestrial meat, and then they moved to fish, and only then they moved to uh, plants when agriculture came. So when, when the, like you said, when the uh, megafauna started to disappear, they actually switched to fish. Uh, before they would go to the, to the plants. So this also ties up with uh, another thing that you can learn from hunter-gatherers, again, not uh, independent of where they are, and this is that the return, energetic return on hunting is about 10 times even more than that on gathering, plant gathering. So every theory will tell you and every economist will tell you that if the return is 10 times more, people will do it and will forget about the other, the other stuff. It's like going in a supermarket and something costs you 10 times more than the other. Uh, of course, you will, will buy the cheaper uh, product. And we actually so see why? that in modern society now because it's it's 10 times cheaper to buy the highly processed uh, grains. That's right. way cheaper. And so many people just make the cheaper choice. But in, right. in, in right. ancient anthropology, it was actually the opposite. It was cheaper to hunt than it was to gather and then also we, I mean, I think it's self-evident that the, the nutrition profile of meat versus plants that they had access back, back then and the uninflammatoriness of the meat versus the plants, uh, it, it was cheaper and it was better for you and it was less inflammatory. So of course they were going to make that decision. Now, uh, Jessica Thompson, I'm sure you've heard that name. She has some great That's research. Cool that uh, uh, kind of the scavenger hypothesis, because obviously humans need a good source of fat in their diet. And we, we always have, and we still do. But her hypothesis is, is that the, the very first tool that humans used was a big rock, not a, not a, not a, not a, a, a worked rock, but just a big fat rock, the biggest rock we could pick up because we actually uh, would wait for carnivores to clean the, the bones of meat of some herbivore get full then we would either chase them off or just wait for them to leave and then take that big rock and smash the big bones smash the skull and we we found that we could eat the the brains and eat the bone marrow even days after a kill because it's basically in its own little airtight container and and so that, that what do you think about uh, dr thompson's hypothesis that maybe that was the original way that we started moving away from our previous uh, diet and moving towards a more I definitely, I definitely agree with her and I think most most archaeologists do so uh, and this is homo habilis this is how uh, yeah yeah it, it, it's actually it actually also meets the findings in the field where you can see the smashed bones and you can see you can actually uh, archaeologists have a way of uh, of separating uh, what they say green bones smash when you smash a green bone which is a fresh bone yes uh, to when uh, the bone breaks later on uh you know during to other processes let's say a yeah. hundred thousand years later when the bone is dry so yeah there are definitely signs of smashing all over i mean they continue to eat the uh, marrow until the, the the last day of of the hunter gatherers marrow yeah, was always be. In, in medical pathology, we have, we were able to use that same kind of technique. We can tell if a bone was broken uh, during life or shortly after that victim lost their life or years later. We can tell by the way the bones break whether right. the bones are green or not. And so we still right. use that same thing in medical pathology today. Uh, you said that it's, it's pretty evident in archaeology 
Now, are there detractors in the fields of paleoanthropology, anthropology, archaeology who would say, no, no, humans are, and I'm not saying uh, mainstream influencers, I'm saying hardcore paleoanthropological research. Are there any researchers who say, no, uh, humans have eaten a plant-based diet this entire time. They ate meat when they were starving, couldn't get plants, but if they had their choice, they ate plants. Is there anyone in the paleoanthropological community who says such a thing? Look, there are some, there are some, I would say, and by the way, for some reason, there are, there are uh, women uh, that say that uh, plant, plants were a very important part. And they don't really name a, a relative uh, quantity uh, because, like I said, Archaeology does, just doesn't allow you to do that. And uh, if you want to ignore the, the stable isotope data, okay, go ahead and do that. But, uh, but they are very, for instance, they find um, plant remains in the teeth plaque. Yeah? And they say, oh, look how important it was. But there's no quantitative uh, evidence in in that. Uh, you know, the guy could eat for for one year. He could eat a little more plants than normal. And by the way, the plaque I think accumulates more when you eat more. So, but they never measure all the teeth. They don't have plaque. <laughs> you know, right. uh, so how can they say that they, uh, there's no quantity? So, but but let's say that the, the main problem with the other archaeologist opinion about uh, this is the hunter-gatherers of today, of recent. Because they say, look, they were flexible. They, because as you see today, hunter-gatherers consume from 20% meat to 100% meat, and they all live happily ever after. So... Uh, so, and they say, okay, so this is what was the situation when we were uh, hunting together in, in, the, in the Paleolithic. But this, this ignores, like, like you said, this ignores, and by the way, I'm, I'm publishing a paper, and I published already, started publishing papers about this decline that you say happened in the, recently started a million years ago, in my opinion. And the humans were responsible for that. And the late quaternary megafauna extinction that you refer to started about 50,000 years ago. But uh, I'm just finishing a paper. We just we published two years ago a paper about the Levant, showing that the decline started much, much earlier. And uh, now we are publishing another one on, on Africa, on South Africa, Southern Africa. And we already have the results of another study from Italy and other, other, other indications that that decline started very, very early. Uh, so, so Homo erectus, which is really the species that existed the longest uh, in, in, in our evolution, uh, about a million and a half years, uh, faced uh, larger animals, uh, and many more of them than uh, Homo sapiens, which he started, uh, began his career about 300,000 years ago. So, uh, so evolutionarily speaking, we were facing even more different conditions than, than we, we do today. And the uh, and, uh, <clears throat> energetic return didn't change. The technology was completely different. The Homo erectus as a hunting weapon only had wooden tipped spear. Now, you cannot hunt small animals with wooden spe uh, tipped spear. You need to have bow and arrow uh, because they run faster. They're smaller targets. They don't wait for you to come. 
like an elephant. If you go to an elephant, he is not going to run away. He's not going to escape. Uh, so you have other ways you, you, you should catch it. But uh, a small animal needs a bow and arrow, uh, a, a, a good one, um, sometimes with the poison on, on, on the tip. So, and, and bow and arrows were available the first time you, you see bow and arrows about 60,000 years ago. So in the last 2% of human evolution, we had bow and arrow to hunt smaller animals that, that we the present hunter-gatherers have today. That's the technology they have today. So <clears throat> if you put the Hadza and take, take away the bow and arrow and take away the stone tips of the, they, could, they can put on the, and they, by the way, use metal tips. They don't mm -hmm. even use stone tips. <clears throat> Sorry, if you take that away and you leave them with a, a wooden tip, a, a wooden tip spears, they will not be there because they would not have enough time to gather all the plants that they need in order to survive. They can save a lot of time by having bow and arrow and have a, a iron tips that they don't have to reproduce you know, for every hunt. So the, the conclusion about the flexibility doesn't hold, but, but it's still most of the archeologists today are not aware of it. They don't, uh, unless they read my paper, they're not aware of it and they don't accept it. So if you talk to, they just, you, you talk to people who don't know, who don't, you just don't know. Don't they, they take the information from the wrong source, which is recent hunt together. Yes. Now, ha, is there any paleoanthropological, archaeological evidence for a vegan society before eight to 12,000 years ago? Have we ever found a settlement where the, the stable isotope analysis no way, no way. No. existed? So in, in the totality of paleoanthropological literature, how many vegan societies or, or predominantly plant-based societies have been found and documented? None. None. Just none. Uh, you know, I think the minimum that I remember is like 30%, which is the Hadza, about 30, 35% meat. So... It's not. It, it's not even close. And and they they know it. And they whenever they can. And this is by the way, Lorraine Cordain also uh, came to that conclusion. Whenever hunter gatherers can take can get meat, they prefer meat. And there's so much evidence for that. And so much evidence, by the way, for the preference of fat over meat. Uh, no, no, vegetarians. I don't. I don't even know if. Uh, I don't think that uh, Western Price found the vegetarian uh, no. community. And I think he actually didn't. He actually go looking initially with that preconceived notion that that he was going to find a bunch of plant based societies. And what he found invariably is they all focused on meat and fat. Uh, the only society that I know today that is really vegetarian is the Indians of India. Yes. Not the Indian American Indian. Yes, yes. The Indian and of I India. Think, they yes. are the sickest society in the world, as far yeah. as the diabetics and heart problems. Yeah, they're very metabolically ill, and although they tend to be slimmer on average than uh, adults in the United States, and so for many of us, we we equate thinness with health. But I think that uh, we're now finding out that if you actually check some metabolic labs on uh, the, the Indian population, they're very metabolically ill. And I, I recently did an interview with someone who uh, is a healthcare provider in India. And we were talking about how Indian culture and society was wrecked basically by the, the British occupation and colonization. And if you go back in time before the British got there, uh, even let's just say 5,000 years ago, the vast majority of people who lived on the Indian subcontinent were eating meat every time they had opportunity. And I think the, the stable isotope analysis bears that out as well. 
Um, let's talk about the Egyptians for a second. Because the Egyptians, through stable isotope analysis and other methods, we know what the Egyptians were eating. Not just the, the Pharaoh class of Egyptians, but all classes of Egyptians. Because many people think, oh, it was just the wealthy people who were mummified in Egypt. And that's actually not true. Unless you were a prisoner of war or a pauper, you got some degree of mummification as part of your burial ritual. And also just the climate of India preserves collagen and preserves things so that we can actually check very closely what they ate. And the Egyptian population, the way I uh, understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, they were literally eating the diet that is now recommended by the USDA and the, the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association, almost no red meat, uh, lots of uh, legumes, lots of grains, lots of plants, fruits, a lot, uh, quite a bit of honey. Every now and then they had some some chicken or fish, but the, they very often they use cows to pull things. They didn't use cows to eat. And so when we look at them from a medical pathology standpoint, their bodies are riddled with chronic disease markers. They had severe atherosclerotic disease in their heart arteries, in their aortas, the, even though, and so they were eating the ancient wheat, not the modern GMO wheat, right? They, it was stone ground, non-GMO, ancient. Uh, I think they were eating emmer wheat, if I'm not mistaken. And so yeah, you, can't, you can't blame it on the modern wheat because they didn't have that. You can't blame it on sugar because sugar as a commodity hadn't even been invented yet. And right. so... Well, give us some 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 insight on the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian diet, and what that tells us about uh, eating meat and, and health. I I must say I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is not my area. Ah. I stopped my my research uh, at about ten thousand years ago. Gotcha. Uh, so I I know everything that you said. Most of what you said I know from just you know reading here and there. But I really, uh, this is a, no, it's Mike Eads, I think, is better than this uh, section. Yes, and so, I appreciate your, I appreciate your honesty, uh, because I definitely don't want you to step out of your lane and talk about something that you don't have expertise in. <clears throat> Let's talk about fire. Uh, from my armchair reading, I, it looks like we were uh, probably taking advantage of fire even before a million years ago, but maybe about a million years ago, give or take, we we harnessed, your, yeah. learned to use right. fire as a tool on a daily basis. And there are some people in uh, the anthropological literature who try to say that's where our large homo sapiens sapien brain come from. We, we were able to unlock the nutrition in plants, uh, tubers grains by cooking them starting about a million years ago. Uh, do you have any problems with that theory? And, and what can you enlighten us on with regards to fire as a tool? You know, it's funny. I just finished and I have it in review now. I just submitted a paper uh, to uh, a very good uh, journal. Let's see if it gets accepted, but I'm still waiting the reviewers comment on that. And the paper claims that, uh, you see, let's start with the beginning. The, the, the story of fire and the importance of fire was first realized by a researcher from Harvard named Rangham. And Rangham, uh, in his initial paper, really emphasized the fact that the cooking uh, by fire enabled uh, the consumption of tubers. So Rangam is a researcher of uh, his primatologist. He's researching. Uh, he's in spends a lot of time in Uganda, following uh, chimpanzees. He's not. He's not an archaeologist. And he came with that idea. Uh, <clears throat> and he is also a vegetarian. So that idea that uh, humans uh, could consume uh, plants. Uh, was very important step in their evolution appealed to him, I presume. Uh, later on, if you read these papers, 
you see that already uh, he, he is getting away from that part of it. And he's talking about uh, the importance of cooking for meat as well. Anyway, in 1917, uh, one smart researcher uh, started to uh, measure what, what is the energetic expense of collecting wood and setting up fire. And it turned out that the expense is higher than the reward on cooking. Hmm, interesting. And uh, <laughs> so that that's presents a conundrum. So why do you find, and you, you correctly said you find uh, uh, some uh, residues uh, a million years ago, and for me, I came with the with the what I think is the answer or my answer anyway, is that actually fire was used in the preservation and protection of meat, and because when the energetic return on on hunting is twenty, ten, sixty thousand calories per hour, and the return on uh, gathering plants is about 1,400 calories per hour. If somebody steal your, <laughs> your meat, uh, you lose a lot of, you know, and, and alternative energy. Uh, uh, and, and this is what actually can justify the spending the energy to, to set up the fire. So, uh, and also what is unique to humans is that humans bring their meat to a central place. We are not like uh, lions that eat the meat at the spot. We actually bring it to our space and then we consume it over uh, days, weeks, and even months. Uh, for instance, if you take if you take uh, down an elephant, and by the way, uh, a million years ago, elephants weighed twelve tons. Elephant today weighs six, four, so double at least double the size of uh, of the present elephants. There were different species. Uh, you could live on the elephant for months, but you have to preserve the meat. Uh, so smoking the meat and drying it over fire is a is a is a energetically profitable operation. So that's the paper I have uh, put it. So actually, the fact that you find fire, in my opinion, is support for the fact that we relied on large prey uh, very early. And, and so you use as evidence to support that, that you gain so much more nutrition from an hour of hunting than you gain from an hour of gathering. And then when you right. talk about the caloric expense of gathering the firewood, bringing it back to a central location, you would actually be a net loss if you were collecting that firewood to cook your tubers and your, your grains and your other vegetables. You actually would be in a negative Calorie and nutrition balance Absolutely. versus look cooking, cooking increased the return or the energetic return on, 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 on plants by about let's say 10% just to make the calculation easy, maybe 12%, but let's say to make, to make it easy. So if your return is 1440 uh, calories, 1440 calories, something like that, that's what I came up with like based on the data that I could find. So 10% is 140 calories <laughs> that you save, yeah? Uh, uh, but if somebody steal your, <laughs> your elephant or whatever meat, yeah, halfway, then uh, you lose like, you know, 30,000 calories. So there's no comparison. It doesn't seem like there should be at all. And so again, yeah. to be very clear, is there any evidence before 13 to 15,000 years ago 
the the evidence that we have show and is would you say that every single uh, dig, archaeological, paleoanthropological, every single dig we found that we've done stable isotope analysis on, is there a single example in the literature of a society or an individual? Uh, that that was a plant eater predominantly, or that that didn't maximize their intake of fatty meat, fatty uh, 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 megafauna, or at least fish and, and and clamshells, you know, crustaceans and mollusks. Is there a single example in the paleoanthropological literature before twelve thousand years ago of a an individual or society that was ate a plant based diet? None whatsoever, as far as I can remember. I must qualify that. Yes, but as far as I can remember, as, as far as I know, none whatsoever. 100% of them come up as carnivores. And when we look at, uh, I love how uh, we call the, uh, the, the technology that our ancestors developed uh, 50,000 years ago, 50 to 60,000 with bows and arrows. And then further back, I think that probably the first technological discovery was when a someone was probably trying to break open a bone, and they they struck a rock against another rock, and the rock split, and there and there's this razor sharp edge on the rock. I love how anthropologists love to call these things Stone Age tools, when really what they should be called is weapons, because I don't know of a single. No, no, they you know, used it. They used it as tools as well. To get the, to get the meat off the off the bones, etc., and to cut to cut the meat, etc. So they use it to also to prepare the spears. So they use it as tools. And by the way, I just want to, to be a little bit more uh, uh, balanced here. Yes, there are plenty of evidence for the consumption of plants. Yes. So people did consume plants. No sure. question about it. And like I said, all the plants that they could put their hand on. Uh, so I think that mostly these plants came from uh, from women, because it's something that typify humans is that we have a division of labor. So oh, the women, because they take care of the children, cannot go far away from the camp because of safety reasons. Uh, so I think that the, the certain you see, as an economist, I'm working by alternative. So what was the alternative of this woman? It was not to hunt. So they had to spend the time, the free time somehow to, 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 you know, to do something and to bring some benefits. And it was enough if they just uh, got some plants. Uh, so yes, they, they, they did eat plants. But like, I, like you said, if you take 12,000 years ago, all, all the, as far as I remember, all the stable isotope. And, and there are many other, many other uh, pieces of evidence. And we haven't even started on the non-archaeological uh, non evidence. And like I said, the archaeological evidence, only the stable isotope can give you quantity, quantitative. But then I found out that actually most of the evidence uh, is in the body, is it, it, right in us. We yeah. are carnivores. We are we are adapted to, to carnivory, and there are many pieces of evidence that are uh, they showing that. Okay, including the acidity, the level of acidity in our, the structure of our uh, fat cells, uh, the winning, uh, how, how long we uh, you know we breastfeed. Etc. Etc. So, and this is a paper that I published where, where I got some, like I think, 15 pieces of evidence from biology alone the, the, to the fact that we are carnivores. We are adapted to carnivory. Genetic yeah. evidence, uh, you know, biological. Let's, evidence. Talk, let's talk about. Um, with regard to the, the fossil remains of our ancestors, the, the height, the bone length, the bone strength, bone pathology, tooth uh, pathology, 
Uh, I'm not. I don't know if you read widely in in paleopathology, but there's it seems to me ample evidence because uh, we actually, especially there, there's a great example of a research paper that looked at two different uh, Native American tribes. One was predominantly a, a corn eater and a plant eater. The other tribe predominantly a meat eater. And they just and these people lived about 20 miles apart. These two different cultures. And we were able to look at their bones and, first of all, verify their diets by stable isotope analysis, but then also look at the health of their bones, the health of their joints, the health of their teeth. What do we what do we find from studies like that with regards to predominantly meat eaters versus predominantly plant eaters in the anthropological record? OK, in archaeology, uh, the, the easiest place to go is teeth. Because teeth pre preserve quite well, including the pathology in teeth, can be associated with the nutrition. So, mostly the teeth are of ancestor. Of, of, if you go, let's say, there's a very famous uh, a picture of, I mean, famous among uh, archaeologists of a picture of uh, a skull of uh, the first uh, identified uh, homo sapiens. That's from uh, Irhud in Morocco, I think. And, uh, and you see the perfect teeth, perfect, perfect teeth. And this guy was maybe 40 years old or so. So most of the teeth that we find in the early Paleolithic, or just before, let's say the end of the Paleolithic, are perfect. Some you have some, uh, uh, you know, some sort of uh, what's the name of this illness that the teeth? Uh, I forgot the name. Some signs of. Uh, in some, in very few of them, very few, teeth that are crooked a little bit. But the first time that you find a very large incident, high, high incidence of uh, of uh, problematic teeth, uh, caries, caries, this is the word I was looking for, uh, with caries, is in Morocco, in a, in a, in a cave called the Cave of Pigeon or something. And there you find also a sign that they ate a lot of uh, acorns. And this is the first time that you find the real, you know, appearance of uh, caries. So yes, and this is by the, this 15,000 years ago. So just by near the end of the Paleolithic. So you see that in the end, the animals uh, the large animals, or the animals that contained fat, this was the problem. The problem was not animals. It was animals that could, that could get fat. Because there's no problem getting protein. The problem is getting fat. And fat and small animals don't have a lot of fat. Relatively speaking, even. I'm not just saying about, you yeah, know, yes. of course, they won't have as much fat as an elephant. But, but relatively speaking, they have... Uh, a small amount of fats. Let's say they would have 30% fat in terms of caloric condition, where large animals will have 50%, 60% fat. So when they did, when the large animals disappeared at the end, towards the end of the Paleolithic, uh, they had to start eating more, more, uh, more uh, uh, plants. And you could see it from, from the teeth. The teeth, uh, you find much more caries uh, prevalence than, than before. And so to be clear about how long ago did we really start to see the incidence of, of uh, cavities, caries, dental abscesses, weakness in the teeth, weakness in the jaw bones? The first about time was 15,000 15, years ago. This is the first, the earliest appearance of, significant uh, cavities. 
And then you that was tell, like, you tell a million years ago, also, I mean, one teeth here and there, right? But, but really, like, uh, you know, in one site, many teeth, uh, you find only 15, 50,000 years ago. Gotcha. Is there any way that the stable isotope analysis data showing that, without exception, all human uh, ancestors before 15,000 years ago? Ate, ate lots of meat, lots of seafood, if they were close to that that source. Is there any way that the stable isotope analysis could be wrong? How could it be wrong? Yeah. You know, that, that, I tell you, sometimes, you know, you see that researchers are trying to prove something, and they, you know, they take present uh, present uh, examples and they say that humans have a tendency to show higher uh, uh, levels of uh, nitrogen 15 uh, than other animals but the fact is if you go back and you, you see that when when you are sure that people ate plants, a lot of plants, and sometimes, I mean, in agricultural sites, archaeological agricultural sites, you can verify that. Yep. You find that they ate plants based on that uh, isotope level. So it's not like, you know, when they eat plants, it doesn't show up. It shows up. The other thing that they say is that... Uh, the nitrogen only exists in the protein, okay? So it doesn't show 100% uh, of the consumption. You could still eat lots of uh, plants that won't register because they don't have a lot of uh, protein in them. But they forget about fat. Fat doesn't also doesn't have any... any uh, isotope right nitrogen isotope in it and uh, humans and and this is by the way uh, you can you can verify from from the archaeological record you can verify that they actually were looking for fat and uh, it's also a, a conclusion that's based on a recent hunter gatherers you when they were interviewed or well they <clears throat> Where they followed, it was obvious to the researchers, and there's very, very uh, a lot of evidence for that that they actually loved fat and they were looking for fat. And when they hunted the animal without fat, they just left it sometimes, unless they were very hungry. So, if you see that humans ate fat or they were looking for fat. It means that the plants could not provide the non-protein part of the diet. So humans are limited in their uh, protein consumption to about 35% of the, of, the, of the calories. Uh, so if they could get uh, plants at a reasonable uh, energetic return, they would go for it. Because they still have to consume 65 or 60, 65 percent of the diet from non-protein sources, but they were looking for fat like crazy. So it means that they could not get it from plants. Excellent. We're we're coming up <clears throat> on the top of the hour, Doctor. I don't want to keep you too long. S uh, give us a summation based on everything you know about paleoanthropology, archaeology. How can what what principles should we apply to our modern diet, given the fact that our DNA hasn't really changed much over the last 300,000 years? What basic principles would you say do the following, don't do the following based on what you know about the history of our ancestors? OK, like I say, I'm, I, I, I like to play it safe. Yes. And uh, and the safest food for me is uh, animal source food. Uh, but I would also 
uh, draw attention to high levels of protein consumption. Because the fact is that uh, according to my studies, humans ate a lot of protein compared to what we eat today. They were, in my opinion, close to 30% of their diet, protein. Now, I know that there are studies that you can uh, get away with uh, 0.8 gram per kilogram, uh, which is, I don't know what it comes up to, but maybe 10% protein or whatever. Uh, but I would say if you can eat two, two and a half gram uh, per kilogram, I don't know exactly what the advantages are, but I can tell you that the, your ancestors uh, evolved on a diet of uh, that, that kind of uh, level of protein. <clears throat> and of course, I'll complete it with the fat. Uh, you know, the composition of fat, I suppose, should be like the composition of uh, animal fat, which is about, uh, you know, 40%, just to be very, very uh, uh, general, 40% uh, uh, monounsaturated, 40% unsaturated, uh, and even, even more than 40% of each, but let's say 13% maximum of uh, of uh, polyunsaturated. And if you eat plants, make sure that they are prepared, that they are fermented, that you know exactly what, how, how sensitive you are to them, uh, and try to eat as little as possible. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Bendura. It's been a pleasure. Uh, if I'm, if you will send me a list of all of your published and pending research, I'll put a link of all of them in the show notes. I appreciate your time today, and I, I thank you very much for being part of this live stream inside of our private group. Thank you very much. Thank you.